voice response. Please, a warm welcome. Thank you.
Thank you, Joey, for, for your very energetic performance. I think you were the first here to go to the red with our recorder oh. for the first time. Good. Well, good. That's a good sign, right? I guess. So, what what is your uh, basic setup? Is is this what what you play live with usually? Yeah, this is the live case. Um, <coughs> one second. The modules in it change all the time, mm -hmm. but this is how it is today. I had never used this one before today, uh, and this delay, I just changed it around. Um, but the main idea is that I have four really versatile synth voices, the the Quellic, the Menis, the Plonk, and the Piston Honda. Mm -hmm. And I chose them because they have a wide range of sound in a small space. and. There's a lot you can do just with them. You know, you don't necessarily need a filter or effects mm. or anything. But I have a lot of effects in here and effects out here as well. Um, but yeah, I just want the most versatility in the smallest space because I don't mm -hmm. want to carry a case bigger than this. Yeah, I see. Do you use the the Nerdsec as your main sequencer for yeah, the this melodic is, parts? This is the brain of it all. It mm -hmm. can store like a million sequences in the memory. Yeah. So it's really useful. Um, Sometimes curious about do you use do you program it by hand because it seems very very intense to. Well, you can program, program it by it. hand, but what's also cool about it is you mm -hmm. can uh, it can record CV. So if okay. you have a Rene or yeah. something, you can just record it straight in. Mm -hmm. The best feature though is naming your sequences because then you know where the fuck they <laughs> <Yeah>. are. Because <laughs> I, I used to use the Octatrack mm -hmm. as the main sequencer and it's great, but I, I always had to remember like A1 is this track, you yeah. know, B17 is that one, and that's a nightmare. Yeah. You don't want to do that when you're drunk on stage. <laughs> um, so in this, this kind of setup, do you clock the nerd sec with the with the rhythm? Yeah, the rhythm okay. just sends clock, and then I see. you know the MIDI expanders right here. Actually, this port you can plug a Sega Genesis controller <coughs> into. Uh, yeah. I haven't gotten one yet, but I might try it out. It might be fun. Yeah, um, I mean, that's what it's made for, right? To plug the the gamepad and then yeah, use that so I don't have to be over here of the, of the built-in uh, scroll buttons. Mm. And so in terms, I mean, it's, everything seems pretty much in the digital domain for for what I see, like lots of noise engineering, lots of uh, industrial music electronics, yeah. AKA Harvestman. Yeah, that's just how it is today. Um, mm -hmm. It's not that I uh, have a problem with analog. This is just the thing for today. I used to use the DPO live a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and the shape shifter, which is not analog, but that one's also great for live, and the mm -hmm. braids. But I just got this Manus Ateritas, and mm -hmm. I just got this new thing, the Shard, which mm -hmm. you can only order online from some crazy dude. I think he's in the UK. And it's like three oscillators. It's actually analog that kind of feedback modulate each other, and you can mess with them with this touch strip. Mm -hmm. and I don't know what else it does, but it sounds really cool. So, um, And then, yeah, this handles all the drums. I don't do the drums in the modular because you would need like a gigantic case to really get the same kind of rhythmic power that you have in here. Like here you have sampling, synthesis, layering of both, filters, distortion, effects, delay, and all that. To do that, you would need twice the size of this. Mm -hmm. and really, Definitely. it's about carrying things, and my back hurts too much for that. <laughs> Certainly. So it's so for you, practicality, transportability is like the major. Yeah, I want I want simple and I want easy to carry because I did a lot of gigs with more complex setups and it always ended up that my back hurt and I got too confused. So it's always better to just keep it as simple as possible. Mm. I mean, unless you're using playback, you don't really need to make it sound exactly like your record anyway. So, like, what you heard today is a medley of, like, a few of my tracks and some, some other stuff. But the, the parts from the tracks are just kind of like the main melody and, you know, the drum pattern. But there's not any of the other production elements because it's not really necessary. You just want people to recognize, like, the basic part of it. And that's it. At least for me. Some people might have a different approach. Mm -hmm. And as far as effects go, you're using the Black Hole DSP for, for what I see. Yeah, so I have all of these oscillators and filters go into a mixer. Mm -hmm. um, in the mixer, there's a send out to the warps, which I use for mostly for the frequency shifter, sometimes for the tape delay from the Parasites firmware. Uh, and then all of that goes out into a distortion unit, 
here in the rack, this scatological distortion. Um, I think this guy disappeared, but it's pretty cool. It's based on an Ampeg pedal, the... I don't know, some Ampeg pedal. Um, and that goes out into the snazzy effects delay. Previously, I might have used Echophone or another delay. Um, then out into my pedals, I have this Electro Harmonics distortion and this Elisis Einco. The distortion pedal, I kind of switch up every time, sometimes a Boss one or Behringer or whatever, whichever one sounds right for the night. This is my personal favorite though, and I saw uh, Mika Vaneo from Pansonic use it, so I, I had to get it. Um, yeah, and then so out to the pedals, back in into to the Black Hole DSP, which I mostly use for reverb. Sometimes I'll use it for like car plus strong delay type stuff. Mm -hmm. And then out to the Malgorithm for bit crushing and distortion, and then uh, the muscle compressor, which mm -hmm. I usually sidechain from the kick, but I forgot to do it today, so I, I don't think you noticed. <laughs> um, but yeah, the key is like you have to have a few different distortions going into each other to get really extreme tonal shaping, at least for me. Oh, and there's this EQ from Snazzy FX mm -hmm. on the end of that, just to, you know, high and low, simple stuff just for the room i see and then do you mix everything together so the the analog rhythm goes directly usually on a your regular setup goes directly into the mixer or do you process it as well through no the rhythm is by itself mm -hmm. uh, i'll take the stereo out and then mm -hmm. the kick and the snare or the hats sometimes mm -hmm. uh, but all the modules are mixed in here they kind of don't really interact um i've thought about creating like a or getting something like a Sherman to run this through live but mm -hmm. then again that's like I don't want to carry so much no, 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 carrying a Sherman. It, it really sucks when you get on an easy jet plane and you have like 20 things you yeah know, so and then if they make you unplug everything at the security checkup it would be oh yeah many times they make me open this up one time the security guard said to me like I saw you play at Kit Kat Club and I was like great so can you let me through like yeah, <laughs> yeah. By the way, I mean the the comment because before before you were playing, we were all commenting about the length of your cables. <coughs> I don't know if you've seen mm -hmm. if you see through the through the. Do you keep it patched? Yeah, I just kind of take everything and then like twist it, it around, in. and uh -huh. it works. I probably will break something, but it'll be fine for the moment. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of don't really premeditate a lot of this. I just mm -hmm. see what happens in the end. No, just because I find it a quite a uh, an interesting approach because everyone else usually uses all this Velcro uh, or even tape to make like way of uh, to make ways of cables into the controls and this is like as well. Yeah, I don't know where to get those Velcro things, so I just don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but any big name music shop, I guess. Yeah, but like the kind of. Use you know, you have to ask someone for that. They take five years to get to you. Yes, yeah, probably. I, I can just buy cables. Mm. <laughs> sure. Do you color code? That's N one of those one of those stupid questions. But no, it's just length. Uh, the mm -hmm. pink ones are the shortest. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, they're going to short distances. That's it. Yeah. Which are, I mean, even the the pink ones are really like seventy five. And yeah. Or something, which yeah, I mean, as long as they're out of the way of the controls, mm -hmm. I don't mind so much. Um, nice. So yeah, oscillators. I'm really into the mm -hmm. Liquelica Teratos lately. Um, it has a built-in envelope and a built-in VCA, so I have it with the SSF filter here, and it's cool because I can send the envelope out to the filter, and I don't need an external VCA. It's all in there. Mm -hmm. And then if I wanted to, I could just make it drone. You know, in theory, mm -hmm. so it's fun for that. Uh, it's good for making noise, um, and also since this is kind of a sequencer-based setup, it's hard to get like you know, like a keyboard you could just touch and turn on. So it's good that you can just make this one go by itself without really having to do anything or repatch. So I like that about it. Um, it's good for filling in sound when you're trying to get to the next sequence or something or other. Also, the shard kind of occupies that role too. Mm. I guess you don't you don't patch life. You just leave as is, 
and then play play along with uh, how, the, how the patch is. Yeah, uh, I definitely would. I mean, I've had to repatch live. Like I played in uh, Cologne, I think, and one of my oscillators died in the middle of the set, so I had to like while still playing, open up the synth with the screwdriver and figure out what the hell was going on, and then complete the set without it because it was broken. Um, so that was fun, but but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, yeah, the piston Honda. I like this one because, well, you can load your own waveforms. I actually made some of the waveforms that come with it, but what I like about it is it has the patch memory. You can save about eight presets mm -hmm. um, and sequence through them. That's a wavetable oscillator. Yeah, it's a wavetable oscillator, and it has cool features like unison and detune, and the two oscillators can sync to each other and then FM each other, and it's just really, really nice, and it has kind of this gritty sound like an old Prophet VS or something. And that's actually what he was going for, too, so it really has that vibe. Mm. Um, the Plonk, cool physical modeling voice. Patch memory is a beautiful feature. Uh, I have like 20 different sounds I've made in this. Mm. Uh, it also has a random patch generator, which is really cool. You can just hit it for hours until you find something you like. Do you use it more for percussions or for sort of melodic lines? Melodic lines. I was using mm. it sort of towards the end. Um, I can show you like a typical thing I would do. Brace yourself. So there's there's that kind of sound, but you know mm. you can also do something radically different. I was wondering because there, there was a sound which was like sort of guitar yeah. sounding like, and there's of course like this kind of I mean physical modeling vibe that you want to get into. Yeah, that's like using the string mode, and also the the guitar distortion kind of helps that vibe. Like, it sounds like someone on the guitar in yeah, a sense, but so. I also do uh, you know more. So it can be pretty too, uh, when you're not distorting the mixer. Um, yeah, and the Manus Ateritas, I just got this. I was using the Basimilis before, mm -hmm. but this one's a bit smaller, and it just sounds pretty cool, so I'm, I'm still kind of learning my way around it, but it seems like a nice addition to do what the Basimilis did before, but in a different context. That's good. Yeah. Any questions around burning questions? Would you get back to the shapeshifter according to your wavetable symbol just described, or what? What do you think? Like, it's for yourself works better the shapeshifter or the w the new one you tried? Well, I used the shapeshifter live for like two years straight. Mm -hmm. um, I did a boiler room, and if you watch it, a lot of the sounds there are the shapeshifter, and okay. I just wanted to try something else. But I still love the shapeshifter. Uh, it's in my studio case. Maybe I bust it out again, okay. but. This arrangement right here really is a lot of power in a small space that when I had the shapeshifter, I didn't have so much stuff in here. So mm -hmm. it's a trade-off. That's the problem is <coughs> to keep it in a small case, you really have to be kind of really precise about what you get. Like I have this small mixer here and another mixer here, but I even might get a smaller one or change this filter for a smaller one. This effects for the Pico version. There's a lot of ways to go around that. Would you like mine to use an external mixer as well? Like instead of that and plug in your stuff as well? Like no, I, I don't think I'd want that because a lot of this relies on the tone I get from submixing one uh, set of oscillators into a distortion into another mixer. So those different levels, are, you know, I need that. Because it's more like for sound engineering, the mixing already inside of the, of the modular, right? Would exactly. Want, yeah. it's, it's all part of the sound design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Questions? Uh, how much is improvisation in this in the set and how much is planned? Um, I mean, I know how I'm going to start, I know how I'm going to end, and there are certain tracks of mine that I know for sure I want to drop, but in between that, anything can happen. 
<laughs> so, you know, maybe I'll have in mind, oh, I want to play this one, see how it sounds around 30 minutes. I play for an hour usually, so I'll do that. But, but then the other 45 minutes, I'm like, oh, what the fuck am I doing? How do I get to where I'm going? <laughs> okay, so, yeah. Um, mm. I have way too many sequences in here to ever fit into one set. But it's also cool sometimes to just pick one at random and be like, what does this one do? And see how that sounds live. And it could go terribly or it can go really well. And the magic happens in the moments where something that you didn't plan on becomes exciting and you can bring it to its logical conclusion and transition from that. And that, that's the really cool part about improvising. <coughs> Also working with a door at home to yeah. produce music or just this one? Uh, well, I have a sound card with a lot of inputs, so I have about 60 inputs running into Ableton or Bitwig usually. And when I open them up, every channel is armed and ready to go, and it has compression and EQ and stuff applied already. So I can just record a live take and then you know cut it down, add overdubs or whatever. But it's kind of made to be as fast as possible, and I actually have it so that my sound card doesn't produce any sound unless Ableton or Bitwig is open, so I have to be ready to record. And uh, you're only working uh, like with this, you know, start and end and the rest is improvisation, or sometimes you have a vision that you prepare in the door and Ableton or something like this, and then you're collecting sounds from each uh, module or something like this and uh, slice it, cut it, and... Uh, it depends on the track, really. Uh, how, what my mood is that day. I don't only use modulars. I have a lot of other synths as well. Uh, a lot of like old 80s digital synths, uh, like an Ensonic VFX, or uh, I used to have a Kawai K5000. Uh, I have a Kurzweil K2000. Um, the new Yamaha Modex 8 operator FM synth. I'm really into that. And I have a bunch of electrons because I do a lot of sound design work for them. So I use those too. It's really about how my mood is for the day. Uh, I do do some software stuff with Arturia, so I use their stuff as well. There's no, uh, <coughs> try not to limit it because then you can get boring. Yeah. Anyone else? So you have some tips for someone who would like to introduce yourself to make a music? No Say what? Producing or uh, preparing a lab doc. I mean, uh, do you think it's necessary to make uh, an engineer and some engineer of course? Or no, it's not. I didn't. I taught myself everything. Uh, and it's cool. Maybe you learn some stuff I didn't learn if you take a course. But, you know, if you don't want to spend the money and you'd rather spend your money on gear or not spend money at all, you can just do it by yourself. It's yeah. going to take a long time with or without a course. Which are the first gear so you will buy? Uh, well, it depends on what you want to do, really. But, you know, I always recommend someone start with, like, a, a synth that has no memory because you have to learn how to make it make sound. And that will put you through the ringer of, why did I buy this thing? Is it broken? Why is it not producing a sound? Until you figure it out. And that kind of critical thought that you have to go through really shapes how you approach everything else. Uh, it's easy to buy a synth that has a lot of memory and has a bunch of preset sounds, but then you, it's easy to get lazy. Or if you pirate 20 plugins and all the sound packs, you know, you're not gonna spend much time except clicking the mouse to go to the next preset. So I try to avoid that. And when I started, I'm 30 now. I started making music when I was 16. I got a, a Juno and a Microcorg, and I just had to learn them. And because I had no, like, no know-how at all. There was nothing online, no tutorial videos. So I just had to figure it out. And I, I appreciate that because I think it's made me think differently than if I would have had someone telling me this is the right thing, this is the wrong thing. And a lot of things I've, I've heard that people say like, oh, you shouldn't put reverb on a bass. Like, why shouldn't you do that? You know, <laughs> whatever works for what you're trying to do, I think is the better approach. I have a question about the electro. Mm -hmm. Do you use the scenes on the performance? Or, uh, or not really? Not today, but sometimes, yeah. You know, I have a lot of stuff set up in here uh, that I could use, mm -hmm. just so I have options. But today wasn't the right day for it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I try to have, like, I like to really know my machine so that I can get the most out of it. So with this, I'll have X amount of performances. I'll have, you know, 20 different kits for my live setup. <coughs> like, you can see I have a lot of kits here, a lot of custom samples. Like, I'll make a drum in here, layer it with a drum from my modular, put it into a computer, 
with a bunch of plugins, resample that, put it back in here, mm. and layer it again until you get, you know, a million iterations on the same idea. I like to waste a lot of time. Also suffer a lot, like a lot of people, to uh, get the right kick, samples and so on, or do it uh, easy with the time? I, I would say I'm pretty happy with my kicks in the last couple years. Now I'm like, it's not that I'm not happy, I'm just on the quest to make the more perfect version. So every time it changes a bit, and I don't use, whenever I do a new track, I make a new kick. I don't use the same kick over and over again. Mm -hmm. So I always try to make it so that it's tuned with the bass line, and you know, all the elements go together. Every sound is made from scratch every time I do a track. Yeah, yeah I have like a problem with the electron that sometimes when you're like playing from one kit to another that the levels of the whole kit can be like very, or can be like sound different, you know? Like yeah. It comes very loud. How you just you gotta, you just gotta figure that out. Like <laughs> yeah. You gotta sit there and, and tune them. I, I had to do that today because I had a new kit that I played with, and suddenly everything was too loud, and I had to get over there and fix it. But, but you, you guys didn't notice. Kit, really? You played huh? only with what? With one kit? Right no, I, I played like five different kits here. Oh, okay. They just all kind of have a really hard kick, so mm. it's hard to tell. And I think I smashed the mixer too much, so you couldn't really hear the other sounds. But yeah. Um, yeah, that's dynamics management is a really hard thing live, and oftentimes I have stuff that kind of shoots out into the ether of loud volume or something cuts out or whatever dramatically, but you just gotta roll with it because nobody notices. And half the time they're like, oh, that part where like it went silent was so dramatic and cool, it was the best part. <laughs> and, and you just, you know, act like you really did it. <laughs> of course, yes. Um, I mean, that's, the, that's uh, one of these parts of playing live that you end up your, your set and you, you, you are terrified of how many mistakes you you did, and then someone else comes and then and then tells you how how fantastic that was, <laughs> because many things sometimes are unintended, like sort of happy accidents. Yeah, which for in sure. a life situation are a bit not that happy at the in the moment, but then for the audience it may appear as something intended as well. Absolutely, I mean, I am, and you will be constantly fucking up. I fucked up at the very start of this performance today. I had the wrong kick selected right when I started. <laughs> uh, and later in the set, something happened that one of my voices stopped mm -hmm. triggering and I couldn't figure it out, so I just went to the next voice. So you're gonna make mistakes and you just have to get through the mistakes. I've had gigs where like the, the bass was so loud that the plug from the mixer kept falling out of the wall and everything would go <laughs> silent. Like, your shit's gonna go wrong. You just gotta live with it and, and you know, move past it. There's no way to avoid it. And it's going to be horrible and horrifying and you're going to want to cry, but you just got to keep going. Can you explain again how you root the signals in the, in the modular? Like how you make, make it? Yeah. Okay, so today I have this 2HP mixer and the four oscillators go into this 2HP mixer. Uh, then they go into this low gain submix. The shard noise thing is also going into the submix. The submix sends out into the warps, which does the frequency shifting effect. All of that goes out to, uh, I believe, to this distortion. And then that goes out to the pedals. Pedals come back in. They go to the delay. Um, the delay goes to the reverb. The reverb goes to the bit crusher, which goes to the EQ and then goes to the compressor. Which compressor do you The WMD muscle. It's, it's, I mainly got it because it's small, but it sounds cool. Uh, I find it's a bit harsh. If you gain it too much, it can distort in a way that even I find unpleasant. Um, but it's small. So you, that's the other thing is that a lot of people really try to get the sounds perfect for live like just like the record or just to a level that they're satisfied at and they spend a lot of time making things overly complex to get it exactly right and the truth is you're never going to get it exactly right so you shouldn't aim for that it's a waste of time uh, you should just aim to get it as good as it's going to be
Anyone else? Burning questions? That were excellent final words. Get yeah. you good as a Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> okay. Then Any more questions, guys? <laughs> let's keep it. Okay. With that. Oh, one last. Yes. Uh, the piston Honda is very useful. I think you can see it on the screen, maybe. Okay, you can't, but it tells you what note it's on. So I bring it to a C. I have down here, you can see these four are just tuner sequences on the bottom here, and they all uh, are making every voice hit C, and then I tune them all to the piston Honda. Um, I did it before I got here, and when I checked later, it was seemed like it was in tune, so I didn't bother to retune. But when I play with other people, like sometimes I play with bands, and I just bring my module on stage and kind of make noise over what they're doing, uh, then you have to tune. So it depends on what the context is. I don't personally care as long as the oscillators are in tune with each other, I don't care if they're actually a C or a D or something. You tune them on the same note or on like some interval? <coughs> on the same note. Because uh, all the intervals happen with the sequencer. And also, uh, since these are very complex voices, by adding different harmonics through FM or wave folding and stuff, you can get stuff that sounds like different tuning anyway. And the sequencer is kind of like the, you told like the hot from your modular, do you actually change this guy as well? Do you try like the, kind of like a simpli more simplistic approach, like Metropolis for example, or you just going for? Um, well, live it's the Nerd <coughs> Sequencer. Previously I used the Octatrack and later the Digitact because it was a bit smaller. Okay. Uh, but in the studio I have many sequencers. I have all those, and then I have a Rene and a Stilson Hammer. Mine is the only one in the world with black panel. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I used to have the Metropolis. I like that one, it's cool. And I used to have also the Audio Damage Sequencer 1, which was really powerful. <coughs> now I have my eyes on the Rene 2, because it looks super cool, and I don't know, something else. We'll see. Okay. I'm always buying modules because it never ends. Right. I've, been, <laughs> I've been building this system since 2010, wow. and, and uh, I have a monster case at home, and I never have ever been to a point where I was like, I don't need anything else. <laughs> You're never going to reach that point, no, unless you run out of money. So. <laughs> cool. cool, guys. Thanks for coming out. Thanks.